you're listening to The New Paris. I'm your host, Lindsay Tremuda. Today is the day after the conclusion of the French presidential election, which means it's the first day of knowing that Macron will continue to govern France after his first term officially ends on May 13th. To some, this feels like a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. To others, a sign that reason has won. Whatever your perspective, there's a lot to discuss about this experience and what Macron means for France moving forward. I'm joined today by someone I've wanted to invite on the show for a long time. Chris O'Brien is an American journalist in the Paris region who has reported about technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship for more than 20 years. He previously covered Silicon Valley for the LA Times and brings a deep understanding of startup culture and technology to the French landscape. He also has a lot of opinions about Macron and this election. We talk about the way that global media has helped normalize extremists, Macron's highs and lows, the French tech scene's evolution, and what to know about Macron's second chapter. Chris, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, we, gosh, what a whirlwind. Uh, the last 48 hours, the last two weeks, the last six months have been quite intense. Um, we are the day after the final presidential vote. Uh, Macron has just been reelected. Um, and I think it would be good to take a few minutes to unpack that uh, before we get into other things, because, you know, my initial reason for you know, wanting to have you on the show was because you are so entrenched in the tech scene and you have this incredible knowledge, having been, you know, a reporter in Silicon Valley uh, when you were still living in the U.S. Um, you have just a, a a reservoir of knowledge that I think is so helpful for people looking at the sort of startup culture here and wanting to understand it, but not following French journalists. Um, but you also have been a very st astute observer of everything happening in the election. Um, and so I actually want to start with something you tweeted on Saturday, which went viral, as the kids say. <laughs> um, you, in a series of tweets, uh, the night before the last round, you touched on something that I do fear um, puts the entire election process at risk moving forward, which is normalizing the extreme right. Um, you highlighted the shocking number of headlines about Marine Le Pen and what motivates her and her base in the New York Times during the election cycle. So you wrote, even if the tone toward her is negative, she has absolutely dominated the way the Times covers and thinks about this election. It, in much the same way Trump used to drive media narratives. Lessons not learned, I guess. So... <laughs> You know, the New York Times isn't the only publication guilty of doing this. It seems like this is a kind of a, a disturbing trend. Um, and it's been it's been done just as recently as this weekend, again, with a far right figure emerging in the U.S. Um, what do you think is particularly dangerous about this sort of coverage? And were French titles as guilty of the same? Um, to a degree, I think the French titles had a bit more nuance Um but just to back up on that, I mean, on the high level question, you know, I think the danger is is two things. It it focuses on the divisions and the failures. And so it continues to sort of stoke this idea that government has failed. It's that it is a failing thing. It, and it focuses on, you know, on the Macron side of the ledger, all the things he's done wrong all the things he's failed to do, all his foibles. And I say that as someone who personally has, frankly, a mixed opinion of him. There's things he's done that I like. There's things that uh, I'm in disagreement with. There's things I'm disappointed about. Um, but, you know, to, to constantly sort of focus on that aspect uh, and then, you know, continue to sort of highlight those divisions and to really – again and again, give voice to people who have grievances. It's not, again, it's not that their grievances aren't real, but to sort of paint this picture of that everyone's unhappy uh, without sort of talking about like, okay, here are the things that have worked. And again, I think you're seeing it, <clears throat> the same dynamic in the US. There's things about Biden, same thing for me. I, I have mixed feelings about, there's things he's done better than I expected, things that I'm disappointed with. Uh, there's a lot going right. But it's always more, well, he's not doing this. He's not doing that. And, <clears throat> you know, here's all the far right people complaining about it. It's uh, if you follow that account on Twitter, PitchBot, 
New York Times pitch bot. I mean, <clears throat> it is amazing. It's, can Not you just, just explain? Can you just explain what that is for people who don't know? Yeah, it's. I think a guy's name is Doug Balloon. I'm not sure if that's his real name, but it's New York Times pitch bot, and it sort of tweets satiric summaries of stories as you would see them in the New York Times, and and it's at the point where you know you do read them and you think, yeah, that's actually the stories they're doing, and it's not just the Times; it's a lot of people. But you know, how many reporters you have to send to a small cafe in rural France? to listen to some elderly racist person complain about the world not being as good as it used to be and people wearing uh, Muslim uh, veils and scarves and people looking different. I mean, again, you, you, you want to be in touch and understand those people to a degree, but if the whole campaign coverage is repeatedly focused on that, you have this, you have this view that I think just, feeds into that narrative that everything's broken and it can't be fixed. Well, sure. And also it's this idea that, you know, essentially Marine Le Pen has based her entire campaign on those failures and that she, somehow she's going to be the savior, which we know is not true. But, you know, she's not saying what she will do. She is saying what the other side has not done. Yeah. And that's a very different position to be coming from. I do know, though, that the French, um, I agree with you that they tend to be more nuanced, but there have been a couple of things that were quite surprising. I mean, the way that they did a sort of Trumpian um, coverage of Zemmour throughout this entire process, and they gave him a, a, a ton of airtime. And then, of course, even recently, there were some headlines like, in French, is Le Pen really on the far right? And I think that similarly does a uh, a disservice to anyone who, you know, is on the fence. And, you know, if they're not really reading the news in the way that they need to be, and there's, you know, we know that there's a whole population of people who are not following necessarily as deeply as they should be, they see that and they, you know, maybe that does enough to tell them, you know, oh, she's not as bad. But either yeah. way, it normalizes her as a candidate. Yeah. Um, but the one other I'm thing... Curious if I can just add one other thing, the, the one other thing, and this is hard for me to articulate a little bit. I don't, I don't know how much of a TV watcher you are. Um, but as an American living in France, one of the things that kind of astonishes me is just the sheer volume of evening news shows. And again, we all have 24 hour cable news wherever we live in multiple versions of that, particularly in the U S or the UK. But it, it really feels like a uh, majority of the programming on French TV across countless channels is basically a handful of people uh, dissecting the news. And so there, there's a whole yeah. industry of people uh, whose main reason for being is to get on these shows and just be yelling about how awful the incumbent is. And <laughs> And so it keeps like I was surprised after the last election that Le Pen was right back on TV, you know, in 2017, uh, you know, ranting about this or that. And and so it's it's a strange beyond the newspapers. Uh, it's it's just sort of the strange dynamic that this stuff is sort of relentless across all the channels all the time. And so it's sort of and hard to escape that. And that's what the campaign process that does not begin nearly as early as it does in the U.S. I mean, this is like a short blip compared to what we experience in the U.S., uh, you know, where they start two years in advance and you just are already exhausted by it by the time it comes to, you know, voting in primaries or, you know, but but it is it, it, it does seem to be taking a kind of um, a turn here where it's just sensationalism. And obviously it works. People are clicking. And, and I think that's also a problem across the media landscape. Um, one lens on this whole thing has been the sort of persistent pessimism among the French, the way that they constantly think they have it the worst. And Sylvain Tesson, who's a, a writer, famously wrote that France is a paradise inhabited by people who think they're in hell. <laughs> How much of that was at play here? How much do you think this is like culturally, they will always think that they are just the declining, you know, once great power? Um, you know, I think really since the, the period, uh, I'm going to forget the exact range, but you know, the French could have, have nostalgically referred to this, uh, uh, how did they say it? The Trente Glorio, um, the 30 glorious years after world war two, when it seemed like the, the economy was booming and their sort of third way was, uh, really carving out a, a distinct path in the global economy. 
Uh, and then I think since the late seventies, uh, the eighties. And, and then since then, you know, there's that feeling of they've sort of fallen from that state of grace. And so the things are just sort of progressively getting worse. Um, it, it, it's, you know, it, like, I'll just like a small example currently, <clears throat> Uh, with the inflation rate, just as an example, if there is high inflation in France, it's much better than surrounding countries, much better than the U.S. So how do you convince someone to be happy about the fact that rising prices aren't as bad as they could be? You know, it's a tough argument for Macron or someone in power to make that like, hey, you should be happy because it could be worse. Like that's not a really compelling way to convince people that their lives are not so bad. So it's a, it's a tough dynamic. And then, you know, you, you, and again, I want to be clear, like there are legitimate reasons uh, for people to feel upset. I mean, there are people, of struggling. Course. you know, there are, uh, you know, things that uh, need to be addressed like medical deserts in the rural areas uh, lack of jobs, uh, a feeling that kids don't maybe have the same opportunities that they did. Uh, and again, I think the, the, the big, big, big one, particularly for the youth, is the environment. Mm. You know, there's a decline and fall of France. Things aren't good as they used to be. But there's a, there is a genuine fear about the future that's legitimate. And for those people to look around and say, no one's addressing it as dramatically as I think they should be is a real is a legitimate reason to feel disaffected, I think. And also during the debate last week between Macron and Le Pen, um, you know, all of the environmental, environmentally focused voters commented on how little time was spent talking about the climate. Every time it's the same sort of uh, complaint. And it's true. I mean, it's only, you know, the planet at stake. Um, but But that's also been one of the reasons why the youth didn't vote. You know, you could try to tell them that actually they're going to be in a worse off position if they don't try to make their voice heard. I mean, if if there was really, um, I mean, we're lucky that the election was not as close as we sort of imagined, but, you know, they could have made the difference between Macron getting elected and Le Pen getting elected and yet convincing them that it was still worth voting despite how much they felt left behind by, you know, both candidates' uh, visions for the future. Um, they just didn't want to hear it. And so that's a, that's a serious risk we have going forward, whether it's in the legislatives in June or in future presidential elections. You know, like, do you think, I guess the big question and, you know, who knows, we can always hypothesize, but, you know, we don't have an actual answer is how much do you think Macron really gets, you know, he when he accepted or when he made his speech last night, you know, he, he acknowledged some of the failings. He acknowledged that there were people who were unhappy, uh, but how much do you think his ego is really going to allow, like move aside and allow him to address what needs to be addressed? I mean, if I, I'm going to choose to be slightly optimistic, at least for the moment, um, to me, that's his really big, uh, it was his big missed opportunity in the first five years. It's his big opportunity for the second five years, uh, you know, it's been a long time since France has had a second term president not facing re-election because they're, they're limited here uh, by two terms just as they are in the U.S. So in a sense, his political career is over, right? He doesn't have to go before the voters. There will be the legislative elections in, in June, but uh, really he's done. And so he has a unique opportunity, I think, to to really, if he means it, to chart a different path. And I hope that if that's the case, the environment becomes a centerpiece. If you go back to 2017, he talked a really big game about that. You know, uh, I'm sure you hear it from your, your American friends. They look at Macron and they swoon over his environment yep. credentials. Whereas yeah. here on the ground, it became pretty clear early on that he was not moving in the way that uh, people had thought he would, people who really are worried about that issue. And that there were numerous signs throughout his first five years when his um, uh, environmental minister resigned, when the Greens did really well in local elections, where he kept saying, okay, I got the message and I'm, you know, going to change now. And he 
didn't really, I mean, a little bit, you know, there were things here and there, but not the sort of radical break that people, the, the people we were just describing, particularly young people are looking for. So I think he has an opportunity to do that now. I think he did put some stuff in place that was interesting at the end of his last term. So my hope is that he really does make that the centerpiece going forward for the next five years. And if he does, I think he'll succeed in bringing some of the people back into the electoral process. Mm -hmm. But but whether he'll follow through, I mean, we'll see, you know, I mean, it's... uh, Well, he... he he did, you know, he he talked a big game about women's rights and protecting women in the first term as well, and then brought on Darmanin. Uh, so, you know, there there are a lot of a lot of big missteps along the way. Um, you were pre- before you were living in the northern part of Paris, or just north of Paris, north east west. of Paris, right? West, north of Paris. Sorry, uh, you were living in Toulouse. What was that? like in 2017 because that's if, if you were based in the southwest that's a much different voting populace well in toulouse actually it's pretty they're they're pretty progressive i mean it was pretty strong uh still on the local regional level the party the socialist party is pretty strong <clears throat> the regional president carol delga is uh is a socialist party and she won a pretty big re-election mandate you know, so that's a territory, Occitanie, that stretches from, you know, the Atlantic to uh, Montpellier, kind of central southwest, south uh, France. Um, so there's sort of two dynamics. There's Toulouse, which is the aerospace capital and doing pretty well. And then, as is the case in a lot of France, right when you get outside that, particularly the east, you have some of the poorest regions, uh, rural regions of, of France, where, you know, suicide rates of farmers are... <laughs> Uh, scarily high. And you read those stories in the paper all the time. So, you know, going back to 2017, there was the, you know, in in between the two votes, there was the ni Le Pen, ni Macron uh, marches. I think they were much larger, to be honest, five years ago than they were this time. Um, you know, there was some optimism about, uh, around Macron, uh, because there is a big sort of tech international community down there. And they saw him as a, uh, you know, they were, they were generally worried about the relationship with the EU. Um, so I think it was generally positive for him with, of course, some dissent among young people who didn't buy the whole startup nation thing. Um, and, you know. and you have a teen, Right, you have a teenager in your household. I have. I, well, I had two. And now I have one. I have one who's off to his first year in university, and the okay. second who's uh, in premier her her junior year in high school. So, what I'm I'm just curious uh, what their view of this process was. I'm assuming that the eldest could could vote. Um. Well, that's complicated. He's not a citizen, so he could not vote. Ah, right. Okay. That, that, okay. That's a whole complicated podcast unto itself, <laughs> getting citizenship in France. So we've been citizens now for a year. Uh, but and my, so my, and then my daughter's too young to vote. I mean, my son, right. though, you know, he's sort of a, he's great. He's, he's very much a, a, a centrist Macron guy, I would say. And, <laughs> uh, you know, my daughter's definitely more Greta Thunberg. Okay. Uh, mm. So, you know, they, they, they have their kind of views on the world. Uh, but, you know, I, again, at the end of the day, everyone's happy that Le Pen didn't get elected. Right, right. Let's, let's count that as, as a, a win quand même. Um, many would say that Macron has been good for business. Certainly he's been good for tech, um, which we can talk about in, in more detail. But, you know, as you, as you've, mentioned, and I feel similarly, he's done damage in a lot of other places. You know, there are areas where I similarly disagree fundamentally with some of his decisions. What do you think should be the biggest push from him, aside from the climate, which we've we've addressed in the next five years? You know, does it still relate to business? Is it more about social policy? Well, if you go, if you, again, if you wind back the clock five years ago and the way he presented himself as this kind of radical centrist where it would, there would be liberalization of the economy. Uh, and again, as an, as an American coming here and, and, and encountering a lot of the rigidity of the French economy, I felt like, okay, there's a reasonable case to be made that there's some reform. 
needed around work and business. Uh, but then the promise was that would be balanced with social reforms to protect people, uh, environmental action, and a sort of, you know, open-minded internationalist sort of view of the world. I think where once he began governing, it became pretty clear that he felt his strategy was to, to lean pretty hard to the right. That was how he was going to deal with the right. And so a couple of things happened. I mean, there were just, to me, sort of inexplicable weird things like, uh, and maybe I felt this more in the Southwest b- being in a rural area, but, you know, he spent a lot of time courting the very conservative hunting lobby. And yes. and so, again, it's a weird <laughs> dynamic, right? If you look at their their programs, Le Pen, for all her faults, which are many and numerous, has, has, a, has a very aggressive uh, animal rights program. And, you know, a kind of thing that for most of us, you would think like, you know, it's a radical leftist animal liberation type thing. Like she's very big on that. You know, Macron was courting this very conservative lobby, which just seems sort of baffling. You know, he picked his prime ministers from Les Republican, you know, from the, the, the classic uh, conservative party. Um, and gradually we saw kind of his supporters from the left kind of trickle away the last five years. And then the other big dynamic, again, we could spend a whole podcast talking about this, was really the, the arrival of the culture wars in full force in France, the islamo gauchism the wokeism, the, you know, the, the battles about uh, what's being taught in schools, the same kind of creep you've seen in the United States uh, and a very sort of anti-American sentiment around some of those things. And it felt like, again, you know, hearing some of his ministers talk about Islamo Goshism or setting up committees to study what's <clears throat> what's been said and taught at schools uh, just seemed like a bid to to win that to play into that cultural war and and to me I would just love to see him put his foot down and say like okay I think he tried to kind of have his ministers say stuff and then he would try to stay above it act like he's not part of it like to me I would love him to definitively say that talk has to stop. You know, we are an open, welcoming country. Uh, we're a nation of ideas. Uh, and we're going to address some of the underlying issues rather than trying to come up with these phony labels. And then uh, at the same time, you know, pull in more people from the left, from his government. I mean, one of the big questions we'll see in the coming weeks is who he picks as his prime minister. You mm. know, I would love him to see, I mean, surely there's got to be a woman out there <laughs> who's worthy of being prime minister. And surely there's got to be also someone who's more left of center who could immediately kind of create the idea of a, a maybe not officially a unity government, but something that's uh, makes a definitive statement. I'm reaching out in a different way than I did the first five years. Now, right. Mélenchon wants to be the prime minister, but that's a whole other ball of wax. I mean, I think that's pretty bold of him, but we've seen nothing but, you know, uh, very audacious claims and and moves from that man. Um, I, I also just love how in his in his remarks last night, he was so grumpy as usual and basically criticized, you know, Macron from top to bottom and then was like, I would still like to be prime minister. <laughs> I just I, you could just imagine the the, you know firecrackers going off if they were to be in the same room having to negotiate. But um, you've called Macron the startup president, and you've written actually a whole series of articles looking at his rise, primarily from, you know, when he was uh, campaigning in the first uh, in the first election um, to now. How would you say your perspective of him has changed? Would you say he still he still earns that label? Well, I think in, in calling him the startup president, what impressed me five years ago was that he sort of conjured this whole thing out of nothing. And, you mm. know, he, the, the, what became now known as uh, Le Republic en Marche, what was called during the campaign en Marche, uh, most of that time, pundits looked at him and thought of him as a sort of creature of the media or a cult of personality or. It's kind of a paper tiger candidate. 
and they were continually surprised at his strength. And there were, uh, you know, other circumstances that came into play that helped him certainly. Uh, but I think they missed underneath the surface this genuine movement he had built using digital tools, using some of the Obama campaign tactics, uh, which both helped him win the election and then in the legislatives really shocked people that he got this sort of super majority. I think it was an historic majority uh, where after he won, they thought, well, he'll never get even enough people to run under his so-called party to, to have a chance in majority. And all of a sudden he gets a record majority. Um, I, I think again, the mistake he made, and this is sort of similar in some ways to Obama, who he, I think he idolizes a bit. He kind of stopped the campaign and he didn't really continue to sort of uh, promote his message, but also build out that infrastructure. And so when the local elections came around and the regional elections came around, uh, his party hadn't really deepened its roots on a local level. And so you saw they were both, they were essentially non-players at the local and regional elections the last, uh, what was it? I'm losing track of time. Two or last, last two years, I think, before the yeah. election. So, um, you know, whether they can do that or whether the party turns out to be an ephemeral thing that just kind of goes away after he's out of office in five years, we'll, We'll see. It'll certainly get a test at the legislative elections. I mean, if they get a majority again, um, there's some indication that there's something lasting that he's built. Um, but I think it's unclear to me sitting here today just how much of a foundation he's really led for a party uh, that's that's will continue uh, his sort of outlook. And again, we've seen some indications with the uh, – Gosh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to forget his name now. His former prime minister, Philippe. Um, Edward Philippe. Edward Philippe, mm-hmm. who's kind of started his own party. You know, that's the fashionable thing. Everyone sort of starts their own uh, sort of egocentric party. Uh, but at the same time, it's also because the the left and right are completely fractured. Like, where are they going to really go? Yeah. So I think that makes the legislative elections kind of unpredictable. Um, but, you totally. know, by, by I mean, coming back to Macron, I mean, in terms of being the startup president, I think what he did was remarkable. And I don't think, in my view, that sort of changed. I think, again, what was surprising was I think he sort of then didn't continue in that vein in terms of really, I mean, you hate to think of it like this, but almost in this area, you almost have to be in a permanent campaign mode. Mm. of or or maybe a better way to put it is a sort of a permanent movement mode you have to be sort of continually organizing uh promoting these ideas convincing people of their it, it, i think a lot of macron people think that their successes are just self-evident sure they, they've done stuff and therefore people should just recognize that on its merits that i passed this bill i made this reform the unemployment rate is down et cetera, et cetera. You know, our COVID rates rates were better than most countries. People don't absorb that stuff naturally. You have to sort of think of it as continually building a movement. And frankly, you know, I think that's where someone like Melanchon fails. Like to me, he feels like a media creature, but you know, what has he been doing for five years to truly build an organizational movement? He and Le Pen after the last election talked big about, oh, we're going to get a majority in the assembly were going to oppose Macron. And I think respectively, they got uh, eight and 17 seats out of 577 seats, which is not really an indication that these are truly national parties. So we'll see if that's different in June, but they have a Mm -hmm. hill to climb to actually get anything close to a, a majority in the assembly. So I have to ask, because the other tech question I have, which again, connects to Macron, because it is during his term that we've seen the French tech, the mission uh, French tech emerge. Kat Borlongon, who was the former director, is one of the women from my book, which you know, and uh, we've seen her departure uh, in the last year. Um, and it's during this time that I've never heard the word unicorn used <laughs> as much as I, ever, really. Um 
And in my understanding, and this is going to be your expertise that's going to, you know, shape the rest of this conversation, but a unicorn company was meant to be rare. Yeah. Uh, and yet France is constantly boasting about how many unicorns have emerged from the French tech since Macron has been president. What is this about? And is this even the right metric we should be concerned about? You do a lot of reporting on on tech, profiling companies. What What is the deal? Well, I have two thoughts about that. I mean, on the unicorn thing, that's a general tech industry sickness at this point. I mean, the origin, <laughs> very briefly, I won't go down a big rabbit hole, but the origin of that was maybe a decade ago, a, a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley sort of coined that phrase because there was a shift going on that companies were not going public at the same rate they used to. They would say private longer. And so you were starting to see these private companies raise money that would push their valuation past a billion dollars. And so you were talking about a handful of companies. And so the term unicorn was genuine. Like it's this rare billion plus company, uh, like I think Facebook was worth a billion before they went public, Uber, you know, but you counted them on two hands maybe. And then that just became kind of the mode. And now you have, I don't know how many thousands of so-called unicorns. And now there's so many people talk about decacorns, you know, companies with 10 billion valuation. And, um, you know, look, I think France sort of faced, so I came here eight years ago, you know, France, faced a serious image problem in the tech world that people just didn't believe this was a country where you could build these huge companies. So a big part of La French Tech has been and continues to be kind of a marketing image exercise to really promote that message that this is a place you can raise money, that you can build these giant companies, that you can build global winners. Um, so I appreciate to that effect, why they do that, why they get so excited. Because again, it wasn't that long ago where these investors just would not even think about writing these sizes of checks for a company based here because they'd say, oh, well, France's labor laws and their taxes and this and that and the other thing. The French are lazy. They don't do email after five o'clock. You know, all the cliches <laughs> that are mostly untrue, but you hear everywhere. Um, nobody says that anymore. Clearly, these people are not afraid to come here, write big checks. You see more and more venture capital firms, uh, which are uh, you know, the, the types of investors who back startups, coming here, opening bureaus. I get calls from foreign VCs all the time saying, hey, I'm trying to invest in France and I can't figure it out. Like, how do I break in? What do I got to do? You know, and I'm like, well, here's my general advice, but basically you're probably going to have to move here and hire a French person and really connect ah. the system because it's big and it's fast and it's, it's really changed a lot. Um, but is it enough? I mean, I think there's a fair point to say, and I think even, uh, you know, the Macron people would agree with this, that, you know, that's sort of a phase one to really catalyze the creation of new companies. If you look at the top companies on the French stock exchange, and, and the Macron people will say this all the time, you know, the top companies are the companies that have been around in France for decades. Hmm. You know, they've been there forever. The the luxury brands, the hotel brands, the all the classic ones that you associate with the Emily in Paris type image of of <laughs> the French economy. And they're fine. They're, they're good companies. They're solid. Um, but, you know, you go to the U.S. and the top companies are all companies that have been created in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years or, you know, some older like Apple and Microsoft, of course. But, you know, that those top mo the high, most highly valued companies are relatively new and it changes a lot. So that's sort of a phase one to sort of generate those companies. But a phase two is obviously to make that economic impact more widely felt. And so you've seen that. And I think the Macron people get this, so we'll see. Uh, but, you know, they're emphasizing more of the, the manufacturing uh, or secondary jobs related to these companies being kept in France. Uh, you know, it, to the degree that if you build a product, they really want you to build it in France and they're giving government support to do that, uh, particularly in, if it's a green-related 
climate change related product. Sure. So I think that's the key. And again, I felt like this in the US. It's like, you know, these miners complaining about the mines closing, like someone should put a solar panel factory in West Virginia. You know, I think there's there's areas of uh, France where you have deep manufacturing experience from going back generations and it's ripe for companies who need talent to do that kind of work. So, but I think that's the next sort of step is to, yes, I mean, it's fun to talk about the unicorns. It's, it's, it's genuinely worth celebrating that the country can attract that kind of capital now. And it's also fair to say it's not enough, like for it to really transform, mm. it's sort of phase one of transforming the economy. You know, you want companies that can start up, but you want those economic impacts to be felt beyond the paraphic, beyond some, you know, echo polytechnique white dudes uh, who, as you, I mean, again, we could go down a whole other avenue on this. Like at the end of the day, France falls trap into the same trap of 90% of that money going to, you know, young white guys in Paris. Yep. Um, yep. So, you know, there's, there's plenty of challenges to tackle. Um, there's, there's plenty of ways to prove that France and Europe on a larger scale can do things differently than Silicon Valley, uh, that it can carve out a path that's somewhere between the cowboy image of Silicon Valley and the totalitarian, totalitarian approach of a China. Mm. Uh, so, again, we'll see if it fulfills that promise, but... You know, I think, yeah, the unicorn thing at, at a certain point, it's like, uh, you know, again, as someone who covers that stuff, that's just a number on a piece of paper. And those things are pretty fungible when it comes to, you know. Well, yeah. And also half the time it's, it's you know, it's not, doesn't mean they're profitable. Oh, it's, you know, they're never, Uber, they're never profitable. Right. And that's the thing. Right. At a certain point. That confuses people though. Yeah. Um, who don't have your knowledge. I mean, I think it's, you know, shocking, like one company I've covered, which again gets this area where I'm, as an old guy who's been doing this forever, you know, areas of like blockchain and NFT and the crypto stuff. Like I'm still reluctantly having to learn what all this stuff means because that's clearly where the momentum is. Uh, but when a company like uh, the hot company at the moment is called Sorar, have you heard of hmm. these guys? They're like, a, no. So basically it's a fantasy um, soccer league trading card thing online. Oh boy. Okay. And, uh, you know, they use these new tools, crypto and NFT to allow you and I to trade cards, to build a fantasy league, to win points to, and it, and it's, it's a hot area. They've raised maybe more than 600 million euros in venture wow. capital. And they probably employ less than a hundred people. And so, you know, that's always true at the beginning of these companies. There's a disconnect. <clears throat> you know, I think even when Google went public, it was less than a thousand people right now. It's, I don't know how many 60, 70, 80,000 people, um, you know, in those early days, it's kind of a slow ramp up. And then when they become profitable, if they really succeed, then they become hiring engines. It takes a little time. Then you have other companies like Uber, which never become profitable and just keep kind of using public money to subsidize cheap taxi rides and food delivery service. So I think that's, you know, yet another piece of the puzzle. Can they build truly uh, enduring, profitable uh meaningful companies over the long term. And even if some of these ideas are maybe I'm, I'm not the right generation to target some of these things, uh, who knows? I mean, maybe Sorar can, can be that company. Maybe they can really mm -hmm. be a huge French international champion. And then will they ever really generate enough jobs to have an impact back here in France that people think, oh yeah, all this French tech stuff, it's really making the economy hum for me and creating opportunity. Mm -hmm. I think that's yet to be seen. Well, you certainly provide a wealth of that information free for people to, to read uh, on the French tech journal, which you update m multiple times a week. No, um, there's a newsletter that's at least once or twice a week. Uh, you know, yeah. being a one man band, it's a, it's, it's 
I would say that the schedule is variable. <laughs> the goal is yes, that it's twice but a still, week. I hear. You. But that's it's still you're very prolific, and you're obviously this is in addition to your you know reporting for many outlets, uh, and you have another newsletter slash website called French Crossroads, which is more travel focused and is also fascinating and will let people into all sorts of regional insights, uh, you know, help them think about where they're going to visit next. So you're, you're kind of a, a very busy guy. I'm glad I managed to get, you know, a bit of your time. To- <laughs> yeah, I, think I'm, I think I'm a little masochistic about this stuff, but you know, it's, I mean, you've been in France, I think longer than I have. I mean, there's just, so yeah. many, it's just such an amazing place and so fascinating and rich and so much going on. You know, I'm lucky about the tech stuff. I came from Silicon Valley before I moved here and the French people I met in the Valley thought I was out of my mind. <laughs> you know, they were all like, we, we got the hell out of France because <laughs> it's an entrepreneurial wasteland. Like, why are you leaving Silicon Valley to go there? And so the timing turned out to be good. You know, it's, it's seen a real boom in that respect and a real transformation. You know, the travel stuff for me is just, I've been lucky to do a lot of travel while I'm here and, mm-hmm. you know, I couldn't even begin to write up a fraction of the stuff that I've done or, places I've seen or people I've met. So it's great to just have a little outlet to do that now and then. Well, I highly recommend our listeners find you on Twitter, Chris O'Brien, always fascinating tweets, some of which go viral as we've seen this weekend uh, and sign up for the French tech journal. If you're very interested in tech or just understanding how that's evolving and French crossroads, if you're interested in more travel related stuff, Chris, thank you so much. Uh, We're going to clearly have to do other episodes in the future drill (laughs) dig into some of these other issues but this was a great start yep always happy to chat thank you for having me that's the show for today as always thank you for listening subscribing and sharing with friends you can find all previous episodes of the new paris podcast wherever you stream your podcasts and on world radio paris if you're enjoying these conversations please consider picking up a copy of the new paris book or my recent release the new parisienne from your local booksellers Until next time, adiento.